Right. So we're going to have, I'm not completely sure how to pronounce all of the Greek words that we're potentially going to look at. Uh, I just spent two minutes uh, trying to search engine it, to be honest. But kenosis is the pronunciation I'm going with. And we're going to look at what it is, potentially the implications. And we're going to look specifically at some Bible passages that speak of it. And then we'll all know. And how good will that be? So uh, it's lovely to see everybody in the chat, by the way. Welcome. God bless you all, etc. So it would help if I had the notes at the top of the page. Okay, so what is it, basically? What is the kenosis? So we could pose a question. Uh, an, a common Islamic polemic is how come Jesus didn't know such and such. I'm not going to go into the polemic too much. But another question we could have, for example, um, which disputes the Quran, if anything, is uh, did Jesus know how to speak in the cradle? Did he know that the world was round at that point? Did he know X, Y, Z? Because, of course, as Christians, we assert that he is God. So um, one of the greatest mysteries of the Bible is the fact that we assert that Christ is completely man and he is completely God. And those two things for anyone who's ever had Jews pick up stones or like has ever looked at it, those things are utterly contradictory for anyone other than Christ. So no man or woman who claims to be God can be God other than Christ. Uh, and that's, you know, the hypostatic union is something that I will actually, if I've got time, I'll go into it. Otherwise, um, spoiler alert, we'll go into that next. But so of his divinity and his humanity, this is what John says. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And I'm going to just another like a uh, clarifier. The word in this instance is with a capitalized W. It denotes a proper noun or a name. And this word becomes flesh. And we know that this word is the pre-incarnate Christ, at least in the first uh, sentence of John 1. So he was in the beginning with God. So that's uh, so we know that he was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. How beautiful. Like, oh, love it. And the word became flesh is verse 14 and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So that the word, as in capital double W, just about to become Jesus' word. Um, so, like, let's just pick up on that. He, the word was and is God. That seems contradictory in itself, but it's not. Um, so he was and is God, and the word became man, became flesh, and lived among his own created beings because we see that nothing was created that was not created by him, not one single thing that was made. Uh, right, so this, I mean, this, all of that brings up uh, a number of questions. And, and one potential question would be whether Jesus uh, being God and therefore the Im implicit implication, the suppressed premise within that statement, Jesus is God, implies that he is therefore omniscient. He knows all things because we know that God knows all things. So did Jesus and I'm going to clarify, like I'm going to make a distinction when speaking of the word who is pre-Jesus, Jesus, and Jesus who is like 33 years-ish on the earth, dude. That's Jesus Christ. And before that, he was the word. So, um, yeah, so that's a question. Uh, shouldn't Jesus know all things if he is God um, and has just merely been like clothed in flesh, become a man, um, and yet retained 100% divinity. How could Jesus be God and yet, as we see in Luke 2.40, grow and become strong, um, increasing in wisdom? 
Like that's a, it's a bit of it doesn't really speak to his omniscience. You can have knowledge without wisdom, but of course that's not applicable to God. Growing in wisdom is not quite filling yourself with information or, or data. It's uh, your assessment of that data, your discernment in that. Anyway, let's get on. So the answer to this question, you'll be happy to know, is in Philippians. Um, and this is the quote. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, that's a big bit of obedience, even death on a cross. Uh, a bit of that verse was mine, my commentary. Um, and that's Philippians 2, 5 to 8. And now we get on to the actual um, epistemology, as it were, or the etymology. Right, so the Greek word for emptied is, uh, I can't remember the pronunciation, uh, kenal. It's something like that. It's K-E-N-O and then an O with a squiggle on the top, kena o, from which we get the theological term kenosis. So it's specifically a theological term because um, kena o, or another version of it, the, the root word can also mean things like in vain or vainly, meaning empty, as in like nothing of worth kind of thing. So the kenosis of Christ is what we just saw in, in Philippians, his emptying of himself of certain divine privileges um, in order to become a servant, in order to display his love, in order for the substitutionary atonement to take place. Right, I hope you're with me so far. He couldn't have been killed if he had manifested on earth in, in his true glory. Um, I doubt anyone would have been able you know, been able to actually look at him long enough to crucify him, but just his divinity alone would have precluded his uh, capture, wrongful conviction and murder, because, of course, uh, you can't do that to God and not to the word of God either. So what exactly did he empty himself of? That's Those are other questions. So there are at least four, at least four things that Christ willingly uh, sorry, that the word willingly gave up to become like Christ, to become the baby in the manger who we only ever seem to think about at Christmas. So firstly, he emptied himself of his uh, spotless record, potentially, his pristine position in its relation to the law. So though, however, he is not personally guilty of any sin whatsoever however he willingly took the sins of those who he who he saves within that action um, and to be able to take sin on to himself again um, like we know of the father well actually we know of Yahweh in the Old Testament he can't be in the presence of sin um, and therefore Christ also could not have not not could not, would not have performed that feat if he hadn't have emptied himself sufficiently in order to be able to take the, hu like the humiliation, the degradation, the, yeah, just the, uh, the spitting in the face, the, all of the, uh, the good stuff. So he wasn't personally guilty of anything. Um, but, and Paul makes this clear when he writes, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So there's two confirmations just within that. One, that he knew no sin, he was utterly sinless um, and therefore a perfect keeper of the law which he had supremacy over, being the one who who, um, who gave it out, literally. Um, and for our sake, he became sin, as it were, or sin. Yeah, he was cursed with our curse. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. And that's 2 Corinthians 5.21 for anybody who's... Uh, taking notes. Secondly, he emptied himself of his rightful ownership of everything. And when I say everything, I mean it, everything. He um, 
although he created everything um, and is therefore like that denotes ownership as it were and also he's the sustainer of all things um, he had to borrow like via his uh, earthly like mother and her husband he had to borrow a place to be born um, as a man he borrowed uh, places to sleep boats to preach in um you know, a room to eat the last supper, a tomb even to be buried in, uh, a donkey to ride into, you know, like, yeah. He he renounced or emptied himself of his rightful ownership of all of these things as God does own all things or has authority over is maybe a better term. Thirdly, right, he emptied himself of his heavenly glory that he shared with the Father, and we know that he asks, um, well, let's look at the at the text. Right before his arrest, which as we're in Holy Week at the moment, we should all be kind of looking through these uh, the story of his triumphal uh, entrance and his uh, subsequent crucifixion slash murder, assassination. I don't know how you want to talk about it. Anywho, right before his arrest, this is what he prayed. I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And that's uh, according to John 17, 4 and 5. Fourthly, lastly, uh, lastly in this list, is this is not exhaustive, he emptied himself of his divine knowledge. And that, I think, it's probably what I kind of jump to when I think of uh, the emptying that we see in Hebrews. And I am going to go through Hebrews um, a little. I love Hebrews. Okay, so he emptied himself of his divine knowledge. Um, and this required Jesus to rely solely on the Father, which is a perfect example for mankind. Um, you know, if we are to follow him and become little Christs, to become Christ-like, he has already shown us by example um everything we need to know basically and you will you'll uh let's see how to put this the bible is paramount in learning these things so and one could argue that that is why christ the man christ the one who was on the earth for that time didn't know when his own second coming would be um and if you look to matthew 24 36 you can, you can see that he had voluntarily given up um, any information that he was especially privileged to as huh, the creator of all things. Okay, so a number of other Bible verses indicate his emptying of divine knowledge specifically. He who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. That's John. Love a bit of John as well. John 8, 26. Uh, John 8, 28, so only two verses later, I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And John again, 15, 15, all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. That's lovely. Very, very nice. So with the kenosis, he provides um, the perfect example. I mean, it can only be perfect because it's him doing it, but an example of how we all should strive to live. Complete and utter dependence, reliance, uh, union or closeness at least. Actually, union through Christ, or the blood of Christ, on God for everything. And that includes uh, wisdom, I like the Holy Spirit, and knowledge. And that's the Logos. So did he know how to speak in the manger? Did he know that the world was round? Did he know, you know, X, Y, Z? In his divinity, yes, he knew all things. He knows all things to the end of time, from the beginning of time. He knows, he knows, he knows. What can you say? He knows. Um, however, during his earthly, his time on earth, his earthly ministry, he willingly emptied himself of numerous, like more than four, numerous privileges. And thus in his human nature, he did not have access to that knowledge, access to that he didn't have uh, the immediate knowledge. It was, you know, potentially somewhere in his subconscious, but he didn't have access to it. And the overall lesson, I guess, before I just jump into Hebrews, 
is that this is how we should uh, act accordingly, act as Christ did in relying on the Father for to be the source of uh, knowledge, the, you know, the source of all good things and all blessings and all uh, edifying spiritual and intellectual pursuits. If we go back to his word, big W and small W, i.e. the Bible, well, Christ and the Bible, I mean, how far wrong do you think you can go? Well, <laughs> sorry, I just thought of those Hebrew Israelites. But I mean, if you have the, the, the uh, Holy Spirit then the, and the discernment and the fellowship and, and Christians around you to discuss these things, you'd be all right, kid. Okay, so, um, yeah, why, why should we? I mean, he didn't even cling to the throne that was rightfully his in heaven. So why why would we cling to, like, secular uh, explanations for, for di- things of divine origin? I mean, it doesn't make much sense. All right, over to Hebrews, if I can find it. Yes, I can. And the translation I have is the World English Bible. It's, it's kind of one of my favourites, to be honest. But let's have a look. So I'm just going to read a few verses, and this is Hebrews 1, and this is from verse 1. God, having in the past spoken to the fathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, has at the end of these days spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. His Son is the radiance of his glory, the very image of his substance and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself made purification for our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they have. Right, and now let's see how. Four. Okay, because there's, I mean, it goes on to, right, let, let me not do the spoiler alert. For to which of the angels did he say at any time, you are my son, today I have become your father? And again, I will be to him a father and he will be to me a son. The answer is none of them. Again, when he brings in the firstborn into the world, and if you're not sure of the term firstborn, just check the video I just made, uh, let all the angels of God worship him. Can you imagine this? Like God telling angels to worship anything other than God. It's not going to happen. Of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his servants a flame of fire? But of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, Your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth. The heavens are the works of your hands. They, meaning the heavens and the earth, will perish, but you continue. They all will grow old like a garment does. As a mantle, you will roll them up and they will be changed but you are the same. Your years will not fail. Oh, I love it. But which of the angels has he told at any time, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies the footstool of your feet? Aren't they all serving spirits? That they referring to the angels? Sent out to do service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. And basically without going the entire way, oh, I don't know, I get tempted sometimes. Let's have a look. Without going all the way through it, a lot, a lot, many times I have heard the quote, um, made lesser than the angels, um, as if to say that's the entirety of the book of Hebrews. It's just like verse one, he was made less than the angels, the end. It's not, he was made lesser than the angels, um, but not of the angels. Let me see if I can find that verse, because it, as always, uh, as often, rather, if you just read forward, um, you find that yeah the answer is right there i don't think this is quite the verse i'm looking for but uh but one has somewhat one has somewhere testified saying what is man that you think of him or the son of man that you care for him you made him a little lower than the angels you crowned him with glory and honor and remember god does not share his glory 
uh, you have put all things in subjugation under his feet. For in that he subjected all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. Doesn't sound very less to me, to be fair. But now we don't see all things subjected to him yet. And now I think I found it now. But we see him who has been, it's not it, but I like it anyway. But we see him who has been made a little lower than the angels, Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, that by the grace of God he should taste of death for everyone. What I was looking for, I'm going to come back to the screen where I can see your comments. What I was looking for is um, basically what I just read earlier, kind of Hebrews one, but it's a, it's not. It's, uh, yeah, well, a, a part of it is to which of the angels um, does he say uh, X, Y, Z? Uh, you know, this is, uh, you will be my father. To which of the angels has he said, this is my begotten son, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, um, yeah, he was also made uh, greater than the angels in another verse, which is, is always a handy one to counter. How can God be made lesser than anything? So in short, the kenosis, the emptying, the act by which Christ of his own free will and volition emptied himself to suffer the... Uh, the degradation and the humiliation that accompanied his walk to the to the cross, basically, in order that he could perform the most loving, selfless, sacrificial act of love that has ever been performed or ever will be. Right, I am going to take a look at the hypostatic union, and it sounds pretty um, complicated. Sometimes if you're not familiar with the term, it can seem uh, kind of intimidating or daunting even so I don't think it actually is it's not something I guess that's fully comprehensible but it's not a theological concept that is ungraspable on the surface so jumping right in how did I mean we just spoke in the last video I did we spoke about the kenosis how did Jesus Christ who is the son of God God the son um, take on human flesh while still remaining fully God. So that's where the phrase hypostatic union is introduced. That's where it comes to fruition. And it's used to describe this miracle because it is, it is miraculous. So as we see in John chapter 1, which everybody I hope is familiar with, Christ has always been God and at or the word has always been God and at the same time has always been with God. So that denotes some form of distinction rather than separation. So John 8, 5, 8. Let's have a look. See, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And that's significant one for the I am, which is the name that God tells Moses, tell them I am sent you. And also just to claim to have been alive, you know, all those hundreds of years before is, is not something that a mere mortal could say and still remain sinless as we know he is. In John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. Um, and that is a reaffirmation of the truth that is Christ and the truth that he speaks. So, however, when he came to earth, we know that he became human flesh. He didn't just put on the flesh. He became flesh, and that's as of John, uh, not as of, as in a chronological, but that's uh, verified in John 1.14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as to the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. So Jesus added, as it were, the humanity, the human flesh, but did not cease to be God, basically. Jesus remains one person. He is not 50% person and 50% deity. He is 100% person, man, and 100% divine and therefore God. So those things are both fully fulfilled in the hypostatic union, the union of his complete and utter divinity and his complete and utter humanity. So he has two natures as a result of this uh, cataclysmic event. Um, one of those natures, as one would imagine, 
was divine and the other one was human. They cannot be separated. Um, I think that may be the Chalcedon Creed or the nice like they can't be separated. They're not uh they're not in conflict because they are that they, they can't be separated to oppose each other, as it were. Um also the implication is that as of his uh death and resurrection, as of his birth, for all time he will be God slash man. Um, because we know that his glory, he he rose bodily, he ascended bodily into heaven, um, and he will return bodily as well. And yeah, in his glorified state. So yeah. these two distinct natures come into one new being, as it were, one new creation. Uh, and I don't mean creation in the sense that he was created. So the divine Christ's divine nature is not, and in no way can be diminished by his um, identity as God and vice versa. He has one personality, um, but that personality contains two natures. Uh, and sometimes we see he operates within the limits of his human nature, and these are two verses that support that. John 4, 6. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. So weariness is for sure a human condition. Um, John 19, 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. And even though he was saying it uh, to fulfill scripture, we know he doesn't lie and therefore I surmise that he was also thirsty. Um, at other times, however, he expresses the power of his completely divine nature. So let's take a look at those two. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And, you know, like to put it in context, you or I could stand and shout, Lazarus, come out, till the cows came home. If Lazarus was dead, Lazarus would have remained dead. Um However, we all know the story. Uh, Matthew 14, 18 to 21. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples then distributed them. And we know that there was much more bread and fish than had originally been the case. And that is um, a divinely ordained miracle at the behest of Christ. Um, so this hypostatic union, again, it's, how would one politely put it? It's a human, like it's the result of a finite brain, finite brains, human beings, trying to define and describe uh, the infinite nature of, of God on earth, of Christ. So with that in mind, I'm not sure we're able to fully comprehend how he can be both fully divine and fully human at the same time, just because of the language also that's used. Fully generally means to the extent that nothing else can encroach upon it. It is full. You know, you are fully uh, human and therefore by implication linguistically, you are nothing other than human in terms of your uh, essence or your, I don't know, manifestation on the earth. However, we know that Christ is, is an example and the only example of a, um, a breaking of this rule of linguistics, as it were, and theology. So it can be beyond our comprehension. And um, for example, Jesus is and always has been God's son. So that on the surface can seem uh, a little counterintuitive. He obviously uh, was the son, the eternal son, before his debut appearance in the manger. And yet we see at the baptism that God says, this day I have begotten thee. Um, and that implies a different kind of sonship as well. And also at his birth, he became a um, the human son of Mary, for sure. Um, so he's always been the son of God, although there are a couple of points throughout eternity 
that we can look to and and be mistaken in assuming that that's when he became this thing. He didn't ever become the son, the eternal son. In the beginning was the eternal son, already there, been there ages. By, by the time the beginning rolled around, oh, it, you know, a long time. Okay, so um, he was conceived in Mary by the Holy Spirit. Again, like conception denotes, you know, prior to that, there was nothing there. Um, and yet we know the eternal son throughout eternity remains the son and lessened and lowered himself in order to be born of a woman. Um, and at the point of inception, John 1.14 is, uh, is displayed there. Did I say inception? Conception. So it's also true that he had... Yeah, he's eternally existed. And yet as Jesus Christ, this is where the distinction should always be drawn. As the word, he is eternal, as the eternal son, the clue is in the title. However, as the man, in brackets God, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the coming Messiah, um, the seed of David, he has an alternate existence, if you like, for those 30 some years. Uh, at the incarnation, he became human Again, he didn't stop being what he'd always been. Um, and I'm coming towards the end of what I've got. Anyway, there are very important reasons for the hypostatic union. So I, like I briefly alluded to the fact that um, I think in my past video, he couldn't die if he was still completely, um, he is completely God. See, it's the restrictions of linguistics. He couldn't have died if he had not took on the very nature that is fallen, that is prone to sin. He isn't prone to sin. He never did sin. But he takes on the flesh because the, the flesh is where the curse is, uh, to put no, not too fine a point on it. Um, and also, one of, like one of the most amazing verses, he, I love a bit of Hebrews. I've got to say it again. So Hebrews 2 17 tells us this therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people we also see in Hebrews that um, he was tempted in every way in order that he feels no shame in calling us brothers and sisters um so he could not have done that without the hypostatic union. Without the 100% humanity part of him, he could not have been tempted in every way because God cannot be tempted and God, you know, won't be mocked either, basically. Um, okay, so the spiritual high priest, Hebrews 4, 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect, I don't want to click off the page, I've only got a shortened, ah, shucks, I'll do it. But one that in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And that's the, uh, the crucial part of that sentence. Uh, Hebrews, again, surprise, surprise. 9, 11 to 12. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places. Um, and if you remember your, oh, I don't know, huh? Deuteronomy, potentially Exodus. Yeah, the, the, uh, the tent of assembly was uh, oh, in absolute micro detail um, given as an instruction on how to make this, what to do there, you know, the holy of holies, etc. The end of that verse, by the way, is um, not with hands. That is not of this creation. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, as did the Israelites. That's not what the verse says. That's what I'm saying. But by means of his own blood, which was as um, a perfect offering as a perfect 
example of mankind able uh, supernaturally to atone for all of our sins, past, present, and future, thus securing, says the verse, an eternal redemption. He doesn't need to come and do it again. He will never have to suffer that indignity again. Praise God for that, uh, please. Um, so he becomes a mediator between God, who he, he is, and man, who he is. Like the, the, the synchronicity, like the simplicity and the beauty of it is just I like it it's very um pleasing like when you when you think of these things so he secured our redemption by being himself by by causing a connection between completely divine and completely human which we are as it were completely human he died on the cross to atone for the sins of those who believe and that is reminiscent of uh of what Cherokee put in the live chat. Um, and John 3.16, I've got a story behind this verse, but um, I'll tell it another time in my testimony. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So for those, something just popped up in my mind. For those who say to you, oh, but we're all children of God and we're all sons of God and he's just the son of man and the blah de blah de blah the point that he gave his only son. We do have the right, we have been given the right absolutely to be called children of the most high God. And yet, son with a capital S, um, you know, I wouldn't particularly want that job. I don't know that I'd be able to carry it out, quite frankly. Um, yeah, and uh, neither would you. So Philippians 2, 5, this is the last verse I'm going to go through, 5 to 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, so we're admitting it right there, yep, he's God, he's in the form of God because he is God, um, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. So that's basically a summary um, of the hypostatic union like there's obviously there's a motive ascribed in in that those uh, three verses that I just read but that's in essence what we're talking about remaining completely God maybe the kenosis has some you know I don't know how God could become man other than emptying himself if we if we were to envision a God who could become a man without losing any of his divinity uh, sorry that's the right any of his divine um privilege we may as well run around, um, you know, being Mormons and say that we're all God or going to be God one day. All right. So he needed a human body so that he could die. He obviously, God cannot die. God cannot die. God's word can die. Um, even if you think of it like, uh, what's the, like philosophically, God's word can for sure die on the lips of somebody or in the heart of, of another or, you know, but Christ, as God, was willing to make that ultimate sacrifice. And if he hadn't have, I wouldn't be here for sure. So the hypostatic union, lastly, teaches that Christ is both, that's the key word, both human and divine, perfectly. There is nothing within that union that causes him um, to be less than, I know I've said it before, completely God or less than completely man. In fact, I mean, it does make him more than as we are completely men because he was able to retain his sinlessness, which is something that none of us, none of us, I was having this argument about original sin, have ever been able to do. So neither nature is diminished by the other and he is a whole and eternal person and I, for one, am ever so pleased about that. So, I'm back in the uh, live chatty area. Oh, I see someone's been busy. Um, I'm guessing they've been polemicizing Christianity. Um, but well done, admins. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. God bless you. Lots of love. Um, I'm not going to read the capital letters. I don't have the glasses are on top of the head, unfortunately. I assume, yeah, yeah, you're being as loving as you always are with me in person. I, I can't imagine you wouldn't be. Anywho, uh, we're approaching Easter. 
step out of your comfort zone potentially uh you know the best way to know if you've learned something is to try and then teach it on kind of thing speak to someone about jesus um you know just find out if they have any strong opinions if they have christ in their life that would be lovely if you could help them on on that path that's an amazing privilege don't let anyone tell you otherwise um and for sure pray about it and see if you are spirit led into uh giving your testimony um around and about the place you'd be amazed at the places it can just crop up if you pray for those opportunities Love to you too, Yaya. And uh, love to all my brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, also, as commanded, love to uh, all the people outside of Christ. Hurry up and uh, get get with the program. 